All right, how's it going? Welcome back to another video here in the series on linear algebra. In the last video, we introduced matrices, right? Which is uh, always fun to do since matrices are kind of one of the most fundamental objects that people think of when they think of studying linear algebra. And we introduced matrices with, with the goal of, of first answering the question, what is a matrix? And then also to hopefully provide some intuition for when we see a matrix of a specific form, what does that correspond to or what can we think of what, what it should correspond to visually, at least. And because matrices are so foundational to, to linear algebra, I have a bunch of stuff here on the board just to quickly review pretty much everything up until this point in the section so far to kind of just make sure we're, we're, we're clear on how matrices are established and we can follow the logic. Because this video is gonna be all about saying, all right, now that we know what a matrix is, let's start to look at some properties of matrices. And, and when we're working with multiple matrices at, at a given time, how can we manipulate them and how can we work with them? But let's just quickly recap kind of what we've been doing in a nutshell. So this section has been all about linear maps which we could call A, which are these functions between two vector spaces V and W. And for the purposes of, of this course, we can think of these vector spaces generally as Rn into Rm, where n and m are different positive integers. And we were interested again in linear maps because linear maps are the maps which preserve the, the operations defined in a vector space, right? That preserves vector addition and scalar multiplication. So if we have a linear map from Rn into Rm, we can imagine that, now coming down here, <laughs> to, to this little guy over here, that if A is a linear map, then it could act on a vector V in Rn, and it will spit out the, a codomain element W in Rm. And this was kind of like the, the starting point, I think, two videos ago, or like what we talked about two videos ago. And then in the last video, we said, okay, let's, let's take this linear map right here and, and really try to understand the details of what's actually going on. V, if it's an element of Rn, the domain, it will have n components to it. And W, if it's an element of Rm, will have m components. And that's kind of what we did to start off the video, right? We, we wrote out the m different equations for each of the w, or each of this, this vector w, each of its elements, or each of its components, I should say. And we wrote out each of the components of w very generally as a linear combination of the components of v. So some scalar times v1 plus some scalar times v2 plus some scalar times v3 all the way up through some scalar times vn. So then we get to this system of equations and then we just say let's just rewrite this so that it is back in sort of this vector form so that we have our, our input vector v1, v2 through vn. This is the vector from the domain a function acts on this vector and it spits out a corresponding vector in the codomain w1 through wm. And all we've done going from this leftmost picture over here to this picture over here is we said let's rather than just call the linear map A, let's write that linear map A as a grid or an array of a bunch of different numbers. And this grid of numbers has what we call rows and columns, or we call the horizontal lines rows. So there would be m different rows in this matrix, and there would be n different columns or vertical lines. So we said that a matrix was simply a way to represent a linear map, and every linear map has an associated matrix uh, with it. So when, when we talk about linear maps going forward, pretty much through the rest of the video series, we're really just going to be talking about matrices. And, and we're saying we're going to have a given matrix and that translates to we're going to have a linear function, a linear map from one vector space into another. All right. So, so if all of that made sense, that's great because that is essentially what we need to know going forwards. Now on to the, the new stuff, right? What, what, what should we be doing next? And the, as you can probably imagine, kind of like when we first start learning about functions, just maybe in a, an introductory pure math class, uh, 
we first learn about what a function is, like the most general uh, definition of a map. And then we start learning about how to, to work with multiple functions at a given time, how to maybe add two functions together uh, through the form of function composition and, and stuff like that. So that's gonna be the next natural step that we take here. We wanna be saying, okay, now that we have a given matrix or a given linear map function, how can we work with multiple uh, matrices at a time and learn how to manipulate a matrix? Okay, so, so that's gonna be the broad goal of, of this video. Now, before we get into the, the specifics of that though, I want to quickly uh, remind ourselves of Einstein's summation notation. This was some notation that got brought up at the end of the last section when we were talking about vectors. And the reason why I want to do that is because a lot of times when, when working with matrix properties, we'll see that by using Einstein's summation notation, it will be very convenient to write out various properties in that notation. And maybe just to start, what, what, to, to see how this, how this notation can carry over into matrices and not just vectors, I want to just denote maybe this equation right here, this matrix vector equation, whether we write it in this form, this form, or this form, I want to write it out using Einstein's summation notation. All right, so, so let's, let's do that real quick. So let's say that, that on the right-hand side of this, no matter which version, these are all three different ways of writing the same thing, right? On the right-hand side, I have a vector w, but if you remember from Einstein's summation notation, we don't write out a vector with the, the little hat over it, but we write out just a general component of that vector. So maybe I could say that I want to write out, or I want to solve for that i component of w. And i could be anywhere between one, two, three, four, all the way up through n. Now, how could I write out what wi equals uh, in, in terms of the, the left-hand side right here? Well, we know that no matter which equation we pick, that the ith component is going to be a linear combination of the v components, right? So in other words, I can take a summation going from, uh, let's see, it's going to go from 1 to n, and we'll have to pick a, a, a dummy index. So maybe I'll call it j, it goes from 1 to n. And it will be a sum of various terms of this form. It will be some scalar coefficient, some a term, times some v term, right? Now, if the sum goes from 1 to n, that's telling us we have v1 plus v2 plus v3 all the way through v sub n. So this naturally leads us to say that this should be v sub j. As for the scalar in front, the, the a, whatever that real number is, we could ask ourselves, okay, what we see that in each of these a values in this form of the equation, each a value has two subscript indices, right? So we just have to figure out what the two subscript indices need to be on our value for a right here. So we can say, all right, what, what needs to, to match up with what? And maybe let's just take this, this top equation right here, and we, we can say, all right, when we have v1 both of these indices are one. Kind of hard to tell what's going on. Then when V is two, the second index is two. Then we keep on going and all the way through V sub N, the second index is N. So the second index of A needs to be the, the same index as the subscript right here. So the second index also needs to be J. If we have V sub J, the second one needs to be A sub J. Then what about the first index? Well, we see here, we, the first index is one, 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 the first index is always one, which corresponds to the first component of W. In other words, the first index on each of these A coefficients corresponds to whatever this index is right here. Since I is the index of W, we would say that the first index is I. So this would be A sub IJ times V sub J equals WI. If this is a little bit confusing to you, I'd recommend just plugging in a specific value for I. Uh, it, and maybe to keep it simple, maybe just plug in i equals 1. So you have w1 right here, and then a1j times vj, summing from j equals 1 through n. You'll see that if you were to write out this summation, you would get the exact same thing as you do in this equation right here. So what we, what we have been doing 
up until this point is, is just finding a compact way of writing any of these given equations, any of these m different given equations right here. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Now, one more component with Einstein's summation notation, as you might remember, is that summation, whenever we have two of the same index in a given term, there is an implied summation over that index. And we see that the same idea applies here, that we have two values of j subscripts in this single term right here. So that should mean that there is a summation over j. Turns out there is, right? So when there is an implied summation, when we have two of the same index, that means we can remove writing out the summation because the summation is inherently implied whenever we have two of these indices, all right? So, so J acts as the dummy index here, and then notice that because we have one amount or one quantity of the I index on the left-hand side, that's what we call the free index, right? And the free index in one term should be the, the same free index in another term. So if I have one factor of I in here, I should have one factor of I in here, and I do. So this compact equation right here is probably one of the, the most simplified ways that you can write any of these three forms of the exact same equation. So I guess this would be a fourth form of the equation. And, and notice, notice too that with, with Einstein's summation notation, we've always denoted a vector as a quantity with one subscript index. And that was just just to denote whatever the component of that vector was, like what we had right here. But notice now that with a, with a matrix, or with a function going from one map to another, like this guy right here, a matrix written in Einstein's summation notation is just a scalar that has two subscript indices, right? So rather than, rather than one. And in this, may or may not be ringing some sort of bells in, in our heads because towards the end of the, the last section where we were talking about various types of tensors, we talked about the Kronecker delta symbol as well as the alternating tensor. The Kronecker delta symbol had two subscript indices and the alternating tensor had three. But you can imagine that if I am saying that a matrix can be represented by a quantity with two subscript indices, and the Kronecker delta has two subscript indices, that might be an indication for uh, saying, okay, is there a relation between the Kronecker delta symbol and some sort of matrix? So we're gonna answer that question as well in the video. But I, I want to make sure that this idea of being able to write a matrix and a vector in this notation is clear because we're gonna be using that notation throughout the video. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. Now, what I'm gonna do, we're gonna actually dive into to some new stuff. Uh, first, just showing how to, to manipulate what are some basic algebraic operations that we can perform on matrices. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna erase the board, we're gonna write out some of these fundamental operations, as well as go through a couple of simple examples to just make sure we understand how that works. Okay, so, we're just gonna start off with some basic operations that we can perform on, on matrices. And notice that I have matrix addition here and scalar multiplication right here. Let's start with matrix addition. So to, to do this, let's say that I have two matrices, maybe I'll call them A and B. Typically we denote uppercase letters to be matrix or, or ma matrices, I should say. And both of these matrices have the same domain and codomain. I should mention that whenever we are adding two matrices together, like adding two functions, they inherently require that, that the domain and codomain are, are the same. So both of these are going to be matrices that go from Rn into Rn, okay? And maybe if I wanted to write out an element of the matrix A. I could write out the general element 
as a lowercase a with two subscript indices using Einstein's summation notation. So I can write out a general element of a as aij, and then I can write out a general element of b as bij. Right. Where, where again, this would be the element in the ith row and jth column for both matrices A and B. Now, let's say that I want to add two matrices. I want to add these matrices together. I want to take the matrix, matrix the, the addition of the two matrices A plus B. What that would correspond to in terms of its elements, just an equivalent way of, of writing the same quantity right here, but just using the summation notation, aij plus bij like this, is that is, is kind of in the way that we would imagine things to add together. If, if, if you were to be provided two matrices and say, add these two together, it would probably be in the way that, that you would guess if you've never added two matrices together in the first place. It would simply be element-wise. And, and we'll go through an example to, to I think, make this uh, very clear, but, but I want to just keep this general to start. So whatever the value of these scalars are, uh, we're just going to add together these scalars, and that's going to be the, the resulting element in the resulting matrix. This is very general. Let, let's, let's go through a specific example. Let's say A and B are both maps from R2 into R2. So that way they will both be represented by two by two matrices, or in other words, a matrix with two rows and two columns. Another way of saying that is just a matrix with four numbers. And let's say that A is maybe these odd numbers, one, three, five, seven. And then B is a matrix of even numbers. And we can say maybe zero, two, four, six. Doesn't really matter, right? If I wanted to add together the matrices A plus B, I would just take the like elements and add those numbers together. So again, if, if A is two by two and a B is and B is a two by two, then the resulting sum should also be a two by two matrix. The top left, the one one element, the first row, first column element would just be uh, one plus zero or one. Top right would be three plus two or five. Bottom left is five plus four or nine. And then the bottom right is seven plus six or 13. So you just add two matrices together component wise, or you just match up the like elements and you add them together. Not that bad, right? So hopefully it makes sense. So that, that's, all, that's all there is to, to matrix addition. Just gotta make sure that they have the same domain and codomain, you can add them like that. Now let's move on to scalar multiplication. So again, let's, let's say I have a matrix A in going from Rn to Rn. And for scalar multiplication, we're, we're just going to take a matrix and multiply it by a scalar. So what, what we can do is, is if we were to, if we wanted to compute lambda, where lambda is a scalar times our matrix A, this is the same thing as, uh, let's even write this, same as taking lambda, if we're gonna use Einstein's summation notation, to write our scalar lambda, and then instead of the matrix A, just write out how a matrix is represented using the summation notation. Lambda times a general element, A sub i j. And if we wanna see how, what, what's the effect of multiplying a matrix A by a scalar, you can imagine just multiplying the scalar into each of the elements of the matrix. So let's just write this out. Again, this is gonna seem rather general, and I wanna do this so we have general expressions that are going to be true for all matrices, but, but I think going through like a two by two example is gonna make this especially clear. Lambda times a general element is going to be the same thing as just multiplying whatever that element is by lambda with this equation right here. Uh, and again, in case this is abstract, which I don't blame you, <laughs> let's just take an example. Let's say that A is the same matrix right here, one, three, five, seven, and we want to compute lambda times that matrix. In other words, that's gonna be lambda times the two by two matrix, one, three, five, seven. 
all we do if we're taking a scalar multiplying it by a matrix is we just multiply the scalar into each of the components. That's all this says. So this is just going to be lambda times one or lambda, lambda times three, three lambda, five lambda and seven lambda. Okay. So that, that's all there is to scalar multiplication. Hopefully that makes sense. Not uh, the, the, the general rules might feel a bit abstract, but, but hopefully we see in practice it's not, not that bad, right? Now, for, for the people that are still very new to this and, and maybe it's, it's partially clicking or, or we're still really processing it, I wouldn't worry too much about what I'm about to say for now because this is kind of just like a little bonus. But for the people that really feel like this is clicking and then like this is making a lot of sense and maybe we're going a bit too slow, I would just pose a, a question before we erase the board. We said that definition wise, we can think of vectors or elements of a vector space based off of how they interact, based off of their operations defined in the vector space. And there were two of those operations, right? Vectors could act with each other through vector addition, and they could interact with scalars through scalar multiplication. Well, here we have matrices that can interact through matrix addition, and they can also be scaled through scalar multiplication. So what does that tell us about matrices? Right. And that is a question that I will leave for you to, to ponder and, and to, to think about. The, the actual answer, there's, there's a good answer to that question, but we're gonna save that probably until maybe a second video series in linear algebra. But for the people that, that, that feel like we have a good understanding of this, this is something to, to think about. These are, that's axiomatically how, how vectors are defined and it seems like vectors are, are following that structure. So ask yourself, what, what can you say about matrices though? Right. But I don't, I don't wanna go off on too much of a tangent. I'm trying to, to uh, contain my excitement, I guess. Um, anyways, this is, these are the basics of how to add two matrices together and scale them. We're gonna keep going and next to show how you can multiply two matrices together uh, through a thing called matrix multiplication. So I'm going to erase the board and then we're gonna go through that next. All right, so on to matrix multiplication. So it turns out that matrices can not only interact, I guess, with each other through matrix addition and through scalars, through scalar multiplication, but we can also multiply two matrices. So here's, here's uh, the, the rough idea behind it, at least. So if we're given one matrix A, which goes from Rn into Rm, and then another matrix B, which goes from maybe Rn into Rl, then we can construct their product B times A, which goes from Rn into Rl. And this might seem a bit abstract and a bit general, and admittedly it is. But what I'd like to, to do is to, to make this a little more intuitive, is to simply relate this to function composition. When we first learn about functions, and maybe let's, I'm gonna just draw some quick uh, function sketches. So maybe I have a function f, which goes from a into b. And then maybe I have another function g, which goes from b into c. I can construct a composite function, right? That goes from a into c. And that would be the function g of f, which would go from a into c. And, and the, the basic idea behind it, let's say that I have a little element x in A, then after I apply uh, f to the function, or to the element x, so I have my element x, and I apply f on it, that's going to map it from the domain A to some element in the codomain B, which maybe I'll call y. So after we apply the function f, we get y, and we notice that y is in the B bubble, so it'd also be in, in here. Then, to, to apply the second part of the function composition, 
we would need to just take g and apply it to to y. It may be g of y when we or when y is the input to the function g that maps to some element z in the codomain. So maybe g of y is z. So then putting all the pieces together, we can say that g of f of x, or another way of simply writing this is g of f of x like this would equal z. So simply the act of applying functions uh, consecutively, right? Now notice too that if we were to perform function composition, the codomain of our first function would need to be the same as the domain of our second function, right? And hopefully that makes sense, right? After we finish our first step and end up in this bubble, we want that to be the same starting bubble to perform the next step. And that's why we, we've set up A and B in the way that we have. A starts going from Rn into Rm and it ends at Rm. And Rm ends up being the starting point to go into Rl. Notice that's what we have here. We have uh, BA starts in Rn, then goes to Rm, and then goes to Rl through this matrix product right here. All right. So, so hopefully that makes sense. It's the same idea, just uh, as, as what we just illustrated right here. Now, to, to get a quick understanding of, of let's, let's say we're, we're provided matrices A and B, and we want to even know if, if we're able to perform this function composition. There, there's a relatively quick way of, of determining if, if we can do that. So. The, the basic idea is that if A goes from Rn into Rm, what it does is, is this map A can be represented by an M by N matrix. So we could say that product BA, A would be an M by N matrix. And this is not a typo, even though A goes from Rn into Rm, and you can check the previous whiteboard to see why, uh, it will produce an M by N matrix where M is first and N is second. And, and for, for just that, that happens to be the way that the structure works out. If you watched earlier in this video or the last video, the codomain dimension is the number of rows and the domain dimension is the number of columns. So A will produce an M by N matrix. Similarly, if B goes from Rm into Rl, that will give us an L by M matrix. And then, and then hopefully this way we can kind of see the, the structure. We start with N, go to M, and then we start with M and then go to L, right? So what we would need, if, if we have a matrix product in general, th this, is, this is a general rule that you can quickly use to determine if you're even able to multiply two matrices. Just like if you're able to perform function composition in the first place. That if, if you have matrices of these dimensions right here, the inner dimensions need to match. And again, that is that the, the reason why is just to simply say that the ending point, the codomain of your first function needs to be the starting point or the domain of your second function. And so these need to match it, and that's the only case where you're able to multiply two matrices in the first place, if these inner dimensions match. And then to see what are the dimensions of your output matrix, B times A, that's simply just gonna be your outer dimensions. That is simply, you're gonna say, okay, these match, and then the product, BA, as a single matrix, would be, have dimensions of L times N. So, so this is a very quick way to just look at matrices, say, okay, what are the dimensions? Do the inner dimensions match? Yes. Then I can multiply them to get this. Notice too, that's why I wrote B times A and not A times B. If I had A on the left-hand side, I would have, maybe let's do this real quick. Let's try to do A times B. A is still M by N, and B is L times M. Notice that the inner dimensions don't match. <laughs> they don't match. So therefore, it's, we actually can't take the product A times B. 
So matrix multiplication, as we immediately see, is not commutative. The product B times A is not the same as A times B. In fact, we can only perform matrix multiplication if this is the, the, uh, the order that they're, they're written in. We can't even do that in this case. All right. So, so these are general things that we want to keep in mind. And again, if any of this is confusing, always just try to relate it back to just the composition of various functions. Okay. Hopefully all of this makes sense so far. Now, let's see how, uh, all of this is very general, but let's see how to actually uh, multiply various matrices by each other, right? So, let's see. If we, we can use the same structure that we have right here. And, and to do this, I want to use Einstein's summation notation. So if we have this product B times A, that is going to correspond to, to the product of, of matrix elements in, in Einstein's summation notation. So I'll have a lowercase b and a lowercase a. If we were to say, let's see, we could write this as jk, and we could write this as ik like this, and then we're to sum from k equals one up through looks like m. So this would be the, the, the way that we could actually calculate a given element, or specifically the ij element of the uh, two corresponding, of the product of two matrices through, through this sum right here. Now, admittedly, probably like with the previous operations, the general expression by itself looks confusing and abstract. And I think the best way to intuitively understand it is by just going through a simple example, okay? And, and rather than having n, m, and l, these arbitrary integers, let's just keep it simple and take the product of two, uh, two by two matrices. So maybe we can write, let's say that a is, is uh, one, three, I don't know, seven, two. This would be our matrix a. And then our matrix B, it's also a two by two matrix and make up numbers, two, six, one, zero. All right. And let's maybe first just see what the dimensions of the output matrix are gonna be. So if B is a two by two matrix, A is a two by two matrix, first we would check do the inner dimensions match. So okay, we have two here and a two here. So the inner dimensions match, which means that the codomain or the ending point from A is the same as the starting point from B, so we can perform matrix multiplication in the first place. And you can see too that whenever you have two square matrices, or, or matrices where the number of rows and columns are the same, whenever you have two matrices of those forms, you can always multiply them, right? Because whether you do B times A or A times B, the inner dimension is always going to match. So regardless, so inner dimensions match, which is good. Now let's look at the outer dimensions, and we see that the outer dimensions tell us that this will also have uh, two rows and two columns. Now let's actually go through applying this equation in a way that I think, by saying this in words, this is going to be more intuitive than this, even though this is like the explicit formula that I almost feel obligated to write. So this is going to have four elements, which I'll just denote as circles right here, and let's look at how to compute this first element right here. This would be the element in the first row and the, or this would be the element one, one. This would be the element one, two. This would be the element two, one. This would be the element two, two. So if we wanted to compute the one, one element, the way that we would do that is we would take the, this, this first number right here would tell us to take the uh, first row of the first matrix, and the second one would tell us to take the first column of the second matrix. So we would take this row and multiply it by this column in the standard dot product way that we talked about in the last video. So let's explicitly, let's do that. So to get the, the one, one element, we would take two times one plus six times seven. Okay. 
that would be the one one element right here. Then to, and maybe let's just actually compute that. That's two plus 42, so 44. Okay. Now let's compute the, the one two element of the resulting matrix. The way we do that is we look at the first number and that would tell us which row of the first matrix that we multiply by. And then the second index tells us which column of the second matrix. This is one, two, so we take this row times this column right here. So that would be two times three. Let's write this out. Two times three plus six times two. And this would be six plus 12 or 18. And what, what I am doing when I am describing this is what this formula is telling us to do, except I, I hope that this is in a way that when we see two matrices, it's easier to just compute it rather than trying to figure out what the I's, J's, and K's are when multiplying two matrices. All right. So, so yeah, hopefully... Uh, this is somewhat more intuitive. I, I want to, to just finish this out just so we really get an understanding on how to, to do this. This would be the 2, 1 element. And this tells us that we need to take the second row of the first matrix and multiply it by the first column of the second matrix. Second row is this. First column is this. So we would take 1 times 1 plus 0 times 7. That's 1 plus 0 or just 1. And then finally, the, the 2, 2 element right here would be telling us to take the second row of our first matrix times the second column of our second matrix. In other words, 1 times 3 plus 0 times 2, which is just 3. So hopefully that makes sense, that if this is our resulting matrix right here, and it has elements ij like this, this corresponds to the matrix product b times a with elements, and this is the ijth element. What that tells us is to take the ith row of b and multiply it in the dot product fashion times the jth column of a. That is what we are doing when we are getting this expression right here. And this is an explicit example on how to do that. So uh, hopefully this makes sense computationally. This is how to compute matrix products. And you can imagine if, if these are both like three by three matrices, for example, then we would, this resulting matrix would be three by three. And we just go through the same process, looking at which element we have and that tells us which row and which column to multiply in, in these two matrices. So, so we have a computational way of, of computing them, but also hopefully the, the conceptual understanding that this is simply uh, function composition, just applying uh, first the A function and then the B function consecutively. Right. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna say, okay, let's, let's keep going. We, we've talked about the addition of two matrices, Multipl multiplication of a matrix by a scalar, and now the multiplication or the product of two matrices. Let's now take a look at some, some further properties. And I think the first one that I'll probably talk about is the inverse of a matrix. Uh, the, in, in Dexter's notes, they, they also go through uh, matrix decomposition, and I'll see if, if how long the video is, but, but covering the inverse of a matrix I think is really important, so I want to uh, go through that next. All right, so now we're gonna talk about something called the inverse of a matrix. And, and again, just like with what we were doing by relating matrix multiplication to function composition, taking the inverse of a matrix is just like taking the inverse of a function. And a lot of the terminology that gets used when we start to talk about functions, when we first learn about them, is identical to the, the terminology that gets used when talking about the, the inverse of a matrix. So maybe just quickly, let's remind ourselves generally what the inverse of a function is. If we have a function f, 
and maybe it has an input x. f of x maps to whatever, right? And then we were to apply the inverse function on, uh, on this result. So we have f inverse of f of x. The, the act of the inverse function is to undo whatever transformation or whatever mapping was produced by f. So if, if f moved x to somewhere else, maybe y, then f inverse is going to move y back to x. So f inverse of f of x is just going to get back to our original starting point, x. And, and the general property that, that is true of, of just inverse functions in general is that f inverse of f needs to be the same as f of f inverse. And this needs to equal something called the identity map, sometimes denoted as ID, where the identity map simply sends every element into itself. So regardless of, of what the input is to the identity map, it is simply going to be the same output. It's, it's a map that effectively does not change the, the input and the output have to be the same no matter what input you have. It is like the, the transformation which does nothing. You see, it takes an X and it spits out the same X for whatever X happens to be. So the, the same idea is going to apply for matrices, but as, as you can probably imagine, rather than having this identity do nothing function, we need to come up with the identity version first of a matrix. What is, what is known as the identity matrix. So we're going to first introduce what the identity matrix is, and then we're going to get into talking about the inverse of a matrix. And, and these are kind of just some of the fundamental building blocks when, when talking about uh, matrices. So let's start with the identity matrix. What is the identity matrix? And admittedly, if I've covered this already in a previous video, I, I forgot if I have. So th this will be reviewed, but, but if not, this, I'm very glad we're covering this because this is... Uh, very important when talking about matrices. So let's say that we have some matrix A and uh, we want this matrix to be the identity matrix, or in other words, the do nothing matrix. In other words, if it were to take in a vector X, it needs to spit out that same vector X. And immediately just by establishing this property of the do nothing map, we see that the only way this is possible, if the input vector and the output vector are the same, is that the domain and the codomain also have to be the same, right? Because you can't have the domain be Rn, so where x is an n dimensional vector, and then somehow have the output be Rm, where m is different from n. Because then, if this were true, then all of a sudden the, the, the size of x changes and now we're no longer spitting out the same vector that we put in. The only, this has to have the same number of dimensions, or the same dimension, I should say, as this, the same number of components as this. So that's something first that's interesting to talk about. If we have an identity matrix, and rather than calling it A, typically the common notation is I, for identity, we'll see this a lot, that I represents the identity matrix. So the identity matrix, regardless of what the domain and codomain are, they have to be the same. And hopefully it makes sense why in order for the, out, the input to be the exact same as the output, okay? Now what we can do is, is maybe let's just do this for the two by two example, in the case where we're gonna set n equal to two, so we're gonna go from R2 to R2, and then we'll be able to generalize this for three or, or n dimensions, whatever the value of n is. And this is a, a good way of constructing matrix components. So if I takes in R2 to R2, that means it's going to be a two by two matrix. And we don't, so it's gonna be represented by, it's gonna have two rows, two columns, so it's gonna have four numbers to denote uh, its matrix form. We don't know the specifics of what these numbers are yet. So I'm just gonna call them A, B, C, and D. And our goal is going to be to figure out what A, B, and C, A, B, C, and D need to be. 
in order for this equation to make sense. So this is going to be our identity matrix. Its input is the vector x, and maybe this vector x has components x1 and x2, like this. It's an R2, so it has two components. And after we apply this function to the input vector, we need to get the exact same vector as our output. So we also need to get the exact same x1, x2 as our output. Now, let's just go component by component to, to see how we can set up uh, various equations to, to help us uh, solve for what A, B, C, and D need to be. After all, that's our goal, right? We want to understand what these numbers need to be because that will tell us the, the form of the identity matrix. So, so if we wanted to obtain, we'll start with this top component right here where we have x1 on the right-hand side and we just want to compute the left-hand side. Let's just remind ourselves on how to, to, to compute this matrix vector product. We can think of this as the, the first row, first column element, the one, one element uh, in this, this vector or, or skinny matrix, or whatever you want to call it. So if this is the one, one element, we would need to multiply the first row by the only one, the one and only first column. So we would have A times X1 plus B times X2. Okay. And then for this second element, this is the one, two element, same, uh, or sorry, the two, one element. This is going to be the second row in the first and only column. So if this is the two, one element, we would need to multiply by the second row times the first and only column. So this would be C times X1 plus D times X2. Hopefully the, the idea on how to multiply Matrices with vectors and matrices with matrices is slowly but surely starting to, to click. A lot of times it just takes multiple examples and, and several repetitions of, of doing it yourself as well. But, but this is how we can take this equation, write it in component form, and now it's just a matter of solving for A, B, C, and D. And at first that might seem like a daunting task just because we have two equations with four unknowns. But just by looking at the equations, hopefully it makes sense that they don't need to be this complicated to solve. After all, you can imagine if we have x1 over here and x1 over here, we can just set a to be 1. So we have 1 times x1 plus 0. And then we have x1 is equal to x1, right? So, so what would we need to set a and b to be? Well, a would need to equal 1 and then B would need to equal zero, right? And then we get X1. And then vice versa, but with X2, right? We have no factors of X1 in this bottom equation, so this is zero. And we have one factor of X2 over here, which is one. So the identity matrix, and this is going to be, we can see how to generalize this, but, but let's first write this out. The identity matrix, going from R2 to R2. So the identity matrix in two dimensions is simply 1, 0, 0, 1. Okay. And it turns out that this generalizes too. If we wanted to find the identity matrix for any value of n, not just 2, so maybe the n by n identity matrix, we can write as I sub n. This we could call maybe I sub 2 for the identity matrix in two dimensions. But the identity matrix in n dimensions is simply going to have ones along this, this diagonal going from the upper left to the bottom right, which we call the main diagonal. So it's going to be ones along the main diagonal. So one, one, dot, 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 all the way through one. And then everywhere where we are not on this main diagonal. So this would be the one, one element, the two, two element, the three, three, four, four, all the way through n, n elements. So whenever we have an element that is not along the main diagonal, that gets filled in with zeros. And rather than writing a ton of zeros, I'm just gonna write the, those large zeros there to, to show that if, if it's not on this main diagonal, then it's going to be zero. In case that's confusing, let me just write out the, the three by three identity matrix. And that's going to be one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, like that. 
So one's along the main diagonal, zero's everywhere else. This is the do nothing matrix, the identity matrix. Now, that, that hopefully we, we understand how we obtain the identity matrix and that this is the act of doing nothing. If we apply this to any vector, we're going to get the exact same vector as the output. And maybe if, if we're not quite convinced, feel free to try that yourself for, for specific examples. But, but yeah, this is going to be the identity matrix. Oops. So now let's, let's use this, this identity matrix to, to talk about the inverse of a function, or to talk about the inverse of a matrix, because the identity is inherently tied to inverses, right? Let's, let's be general and say that A is an M by N matrix, so A is M by N matrix, and then maybe we'll, we'll start with two other cases, B and C are N by M matrices. Oops. M by N matrices. So A is M first and N second, B and C are N first and M second. So what we can do is, is we can take different types of products. Let's maybe start with the product AB and look at, and maybe we'll first just look at the, the, the dimensions and see what the output dimension would need to be. If we had A and B, A is an M by N matrix, B is an N by M matrix. So we first say, do the inner dimensions match? And they're both N, right? So, so that's good. The ending point of B is the same as the starting point of A. So then we say, okay, what is the output, the resulting dimension of this overall quantity? We just refer to the output dimensions. It's M times N. So the output dimensions of this is going to be M times N. And what I would like to do is to say that if we can come up with a value of B, such that if we were to take the product A times B, then we get the identity matrix. And what would the identity matrix need to be? It would be I sub M for the, the identity matrix in M dimensions. Again, because this would be an M by M matrix, right? So if A times B is equal to I, what we would do is we would call B the right inverse of A. In other words, if I have a matrix, multiply it to the right by A, and I get back to the identity, back to the do nothing matrix, then it's like we're multiplying the inverse on the right. So we would call this right inverse. Right inverse. Now, you can imagine there's also a left inverse, and, and that would be what you, you might imagine. So now we have our matrix A, which is M by N, and we're going to multiply now C on the left. So C, which is going to be N by M, and if, if this product right here gives us the identity matrix, we would call C the left inverse of A. Just to, to get some more practice too, we see that we can multiply these two because the inner dimensions match. And the resulting output dimensions of the identity matrix is gonna be N and N. So this would be I sub N to say that this corresponds to an N by N matrix. Okay. So, and, so yeah, if B is the right inverse, we would say that C is the left inverse. Kind of like with functions, how you could have a left inverse function and a right inverse function. Now, notice that we are being very specific in saying the right inverse of a matrix and the left inverse of a matrix. And if, if, if you've taken uh, a course or watched any videos like the ones that we have here on, on numbers and sets, uh, you, you'll know that the actual inverse of a function is a function which is both a left inverse and a right inverse. All right. So if you have a function that, that where both of these are the same, in other words, B is the same as C, then, then you have what is just an overall inverse function. Okay. Now, in, in order to do that, though, in order to have both a left inverse and a right inverse, what you would need is, is this condition right here. Whether you, If you have a matrix A, if you multiply its inverse on the right, that needs to be the same as multiplying the inverse 
on the left, and you need to get the same identity matrix regardless of which order you multiply A inverse by, whether it's on the right or on the left. And while it might seem like we already have that right here, there's a subtle distinction because B is a right inverse, but because it produces an M by M identity matrix. C is a left inverse and it produces an N by N identity matrix. But this, this guy right here cannot be both the M and the N identity matrix. It needs to be the same, whether it's M or it's N. It's gotta be one or the other in order to have an actual inverse of a matrix. So, so what, is, what does that tell us? What does that imply? Well, that means that the only way this could be possible is if M is equal to N, right? If, if, if this is an N by N and this is also an M by N, then we would, we would have both cases being satisfied. So, so this, this tells us something, and this is kind of key too. A uh, has inverse, I'm gonna try to write this quickly. A has inverse like this, if and only if uh, A has the same number of rows as columns, if and only if A is an M by N, trying to get out of the way. <laughs> if A is an N by N matrix, or, or what I'm gonna to refer to as a square matrix, where a square matrix is you have the same number of rows as you do columns, okay? Um, because, yeah, otherwise, that's the only way that you can multiply its inverse on the, the right and the left and get the same size identity matrix as your output. Kind of like when you're talking about function and function composition, the only way you could have an inverse function is if that function is inherently bijective. The domain and the codomain are the same size. So like here, the domain and codomain, or like the, the codomains and, and domains are, are different sizes. Okay. In a nutshell, you need to have a square matrix in order to have a corresponding inverse. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. If, if the case is, if we have the case where A is an M by N and, and M and N are different, it's possible for A to have either a right inverse or a left inverse. That is possible. But we would not say that A just has an inverse by itself. It's only going to have one or the other if these two are not the same. So we, we would only say that A has an inverse, not specifying which one. A has an inverse if it is a square matrix. And, and usually the, the terminology that we use to describe a matrix that has an inverse is we call this an invertible matrix. So we could say uh, if A has inverse, <laughs> has inverse, not a right inverse or a left inverse, but just an inverse. So it has both, both a right and a left inverse. A has an inverse, we say A is invertible. I'm trying to write quickly. <laughs> we say that A is invertible. Okay. Now, I know we're covering a lot here, but one final thing that I want to mention, and maybe I'll, I'll ask this as a question first. Let's say that rather than A being this M by N matrix, let's say it is square. Let's say it is N by N. Does that guarantee that A has an inverse function? or an inverse matrix. And relating this to functions, this would be analogous to say that, let's suppose that F, if, if we had a map F, or a general function F, and the, the domain and the codomain are the same size, does that guarantee that F has an inverse function F inverse? So maybe just take a minute to, to pause and think about that for a second. Okay, assuming we've paused. Uh, the, it turns out the answer to that question is no. Just because A is a square matrix, let me erase some stuff here. Just because A is a square matrix, that does not guarantee that it is invertible. It is Being a square matrix is a necessary but not sufficient condition in order to be invertible. So let's, let's see why for a second. And we'll, we'll go through a specific a uh, simple example. Let's say that my matrix A is the zero matrix. 
So it's a two by two zero matrix where every element is the number zero. We could ask, is this matrix invertible? And, and, and let's, let's try to see. If A is invertible, it will have either a left inverse or a right inverse. Well, it needs, to, it needs to have both, right? But let's just suppose that we want to find its right inverse, which we'll call A to the minus one. If it has a right inverse, it should equal the identity when we take this product right here. So let's just write out what each of these things need, need to be. So A is the zero matrix, zero, 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 zero. A inverse, we don't know what its elements are just yet, so we'll just call these arbitrary A, B, C, and D. And then the identity matrix is gonna be a, the two by two identity matrix. So this is gonna be one, zero, zero, one. One's on the main diagonal, zero's everywhere else. And now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna write out each of the equations component-wise. And this will give us more practice seeing how to multiply two matrices. So let's look at the, the one, we'll, we'll, we'll first look at the, the top left element where we have one on the right-hand side. And because this is the one, one element, that means we take the, the first row times the first column. So we have zero times A plus zero times C. Then for the one, two element in the upper right-hand corner, because this is the one, two element, we take the one row, the first row, times the second column. So this would be zero times B plus zero times D. I'm gonna write out the next, the, the bottom two equations here and, and let me know if you get the same thing. So we're gonna have zero equals zero times A plus zero times C and then one equals um, zero times B plus zero times D. Right. Hopefully you got the same thing. And you can imagine by looking at these middle two equations that no matter what value I plug in for A, B, C, and D, these equations will be satisfied. But if you look at the, the top equation and the bottom equation, there's no value of A, B, C, or D that I could plug into here that's gonna have my left-hand side equal one. Because this is zero times something plus zero times something. Same thing down here. So no matter what values of A, B, C, and D I have, the, um, the, the, there's no value that's gonna get one on my left-hand side. Therefore, we would say that there's no value of A, B, C, and D which makes this equation true. In other words, this matrix just doesn't exist. Or in other words, A inverse does not exist. So this is an example of a matrix that although it's square, has the same number of rows as it does columns, it is not an invertible matrix. Okay, so again, being an invertible matrix is a, or having a square matrix, is a necessary but not sufficient condition in order to be invertible. Okay. Hopefully these ideas make sense. I know we're talking about a lot of new stuff all at once. Now, I, I think I'm gonna cut the video pretty soon or I'm gonna finish the video pretty soon. The last thing that I wanna do is just to go through some basic operations that we can perform on matrices, such as talking about the transpose or the trace of a matrix and uh, in, in Dexter's notes too, he talks about different types of matrices like symmetric matrices, uh, Hermitian matrices, uh, anti-symmetric, skew, unitary, orthogonal, all these different types of matrices. And these matrices are, are useful and very useful and they're, they're good to know. But I think that it's more useful to talk about these matrices when they actually come up in various problems rather than just to say, this is symmetric, this is Hermitian, this is orthogonal, whatever. And then you, you see these definitions, you get a bunch of definitions, and then you forget them by the time we actually use them. So if you're following along in the lecture notes, no, I'm, I'm not gonna cover those now, but when they do get introduced later on in the video series, I'm going to introduce them at that point, okay? So I'm gonna erase the board and then we're gonna keep going. All right, so to, to finish off the video, we're just going to go through a couple of properties that are pretty fundamental to matrices and a couple of quantities that are pretty fundamental, and, and then we're gonna call it. 
So the, the first is we're going to look at this, this operation that we can perform on a given matrix called the transpose. And the transpose gets used all the time in linear algebra, so it's, it's uh, very important that we learn it uh, early on, at least. And I think with all of these properties, I'm just going to go through specific examples in a two by two case where we have a matrix A with elements A, B, C, D, like this. So we're gonna start with the transpose, and, and this is, I, I think, probably easiest to, to write using Einstein's summation notation, but probably the easiest to explain just in words. So let's start with Einstein's summation notation, where we can denote a matrix generally by, by its element, the two subscript indices, and we want to take its transpose. The way that we would denote, or the way that we denote the transpose of a matrix is we denote it with an uppercase letter T as a superscript. So if we have this matrix and we want to take its transpose, what that corresponds to is just to swap the two subscript indices. So if we start with AIJ, perform a transpose, this becomes A sub JI. That, in terms of the definition, is what a transpose is. But again, I think the best way to describe it in, in, is, to, is to do so in words. So if A is our matrix, A, B, C, D, and we want to perform, if we want to take the transpose of A, what we are doing is we are interchanging the rows and the columns of that matrix. Here's what I mean. A transpose is gonna say, all right, if this is the first row of A, when we take the transpose, that is now gonna become the first column of A. So instead of writing A, B like this, we're going to write A, B like this. And then going here, because this is the second row of A, that is now going to become the second column of A. So. A, B like this, and then we're going to have C, D like this. Right. So, so taking the transpose of a matrix is simply the act of interchanging rows with columns. Now, some immediate things that can follow up from this, you can imagine if we interchange the rows and columns two different times, because it's just a swap, right? The, the rows go to columns. If we were to perform the transpose of A transpose, that just swaps the rows to the columns and then the columns back to rows and, and vice versa. So the transpose of A transpose is just a matrix by itself, the, the original matrix by itself. All right. That's all the transpose is. We'll, we'll see that there are a lot of really important applications later on in the video series on why transposes are important, but it's operationally that's what it is and that's all we need to know for now. One more thing I think that's worth mentioning is that the transpose can also be applied to vectors in addition to matrices. So let's say that I have uh, a column vector x, little hat over it to denote that it's a vector, with components x1 and x2. Another way of thinking about a column vector is that it is one column with a bunch of little rows that are just one, one element wide. So if we wanted to take the transpose of x, then this first row of one element would turn into the first column of one element. So we would have x1 as the single column. Then the second row of one element turns into the second column of one element, like this. Okay, yeah, that's <laughs> So, and this is kind of an interesting thing. We've always been calling vectors column vectors because it's one column, but when we perform the transpose on a vector, now it becomes one row. So this is what we would call a row vector. And we would say that if we were to look at the dimensions of these uh, two quantities, we would say that X has two rows, two horizontal lines, and it's just one column long. So it would be two rows by one column. But X transpose, a row vector, would it's one giant row, so it would have one row and two different columns. 
So it'd be two by one and one by two. And you can imagine if this generalizes to an n by n matrix, for if you're taking the transpose of an n by n matrix, you're just swapping the n rows with the n columns. And if you're taking the transpose of an n dimensional vector, this is n by one and this is one by n. All right, so that's just how it generalizes. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. That, that's, that's what the transpose is. So I'm gonna just keep that definition up there, but, but yeah, hopefully we have an idea, a good idea of, of what, what that means. Next thing I wanna do is to introduce the trace of a matrix. And again, it's one of these things that I think is the best, uh, in terms of definition, just writing out what it is. So the trace of a matrix so is written uh, lowercase t and lowercase r for short of trace. And then you're saying the trace of a given matrix, which is A. And the way that it's computed is simply A sub i i using Einstein's summation notation. So let's keep in mind here what this means. The, the two subscript indices i indicate that there is an inherent summation over i, an implied summation. We can write this as the sum going from i equals 1 to n, a i i. Or if we have an n by n matrix, it's going to be a 1 1 plus a 2 2 plus all the way through a n n, like this. So it's simply taking the, the sum of the main diagonal elements. The, the trace takes a matrix as an input and spits out just a scalar, a single corresponding number. Let's see what the trace for a for this specific case is right here. So if, if our matrix is um, just a two by two case, then all we would need to do is we would need to take a11 plus a22. And then we just ask ourselves what those elements are. a11 is just a. A22 is D. So the trace of this matrix right here would just be the quantity A plus D. All right. That's how we take the trace. And, and again, like with the transpose, we'll see later on in the video series that there are certain properties of, uh, or, or certain properties where it becomes very useful to compute the trace. Uh, and I think we're really going to see its power later on in the, the video series, but just introducing this now, I think, is a good first step. Uh, and finally, we're going to look at the inverse of a matrix product. So we were just talking in the last whiteboard about the inverse of a matrix, right? Where we said that in order to have a matrix A be invertible, it first needs to be square. So the number of rows needs to be this, the number of columns. And it would have the property that A times A inverse equals A inverse times A equals the identity matrix. Now, let's suppose that, that rather than looking at the inverse of a single matrix, we have two matrices in the product together, A, B. And we want to ask ourselves, what is the, the inverse of this matrix product? In other words, what is the quantity AB to the, to the minus one? And the way that we can do this is, is we can say, well, if this is, if we want to find the inverse and we're assuming the inverse exists, meaning AB has both a left and a right inverse, then we should be able to take this inverse element, multiply it by AB by itself, and we should get the identity matrix as the output. Okay. And I'm simply going to provide the result and then show you why the result works. So it turns out that if we were to take a matrix product AB, take its inverse, that is going to be the same thing as B inverse times A inverse, which is kind of odd, right? Because our intuition might initially tell us that if we wanted to take AB inverse, that should be A inverse times B inverse, like the minus one would distribute but it turns out that the order also swaps. And, and let's see why the order swaps. And I think the, the best way to understand this is just to plug this into here and, and see why this works. So rather than writing AB quantity inverse, I'm just gonna replace that with this right-hand side of B inverse, A inverse, and then multiplying it still on the right by AB, 
and we want that to ultimately equal i. So these middle two terms are a inverse times a, and those are going to cancel out because uh, if this is a inverse, this should equal the identity, right? So then we're left with b inverse times the identity times b. But the identity times anything is just itself, right? So this is really just b inverse times b. But then these cancel out, right? And, and that gives us the identity, <laughs> again. So, so ultimately, we, we do get the identity. Uh, and, and that's why this expression here is true. Now, maybe just to, to finish off the video, one analogy that I like to use to try to make sense of this is to, uh, to at least in our, our heads, to try to see why this is intuitive, is to imagine uh, A and B as literal transformations. After all, in the last video, we thought of a matrix as a, or we thought of a, a matrix visually as a transformation of all the arrows in space. So let's just think of these as, as, as transformations, but maybe not arrows in space. I want to think of it in terms of uh, our feet, which might seem a little odd. But let's suppose that, I want to make sure I get this right here, that if we have A, B, that we're going to say B is the act of putting your socks on. <laughs> let's do this. Put socks on. Bear with me. This, this will hopefully make sense. This, this is how I memorized it. Uh, and hopefully you won't need to memorize it, but it's an easy way of understanding it. So B is the act of putting your socks on and A is the act of putting shoes on. So put shoes on. If, if these are, if A and B correspond to these operations and it takes in us, smiley, as an input, what we're going to start off barefoot <laughs> And after we apply B to us, we have put our socks on, right? So, so then after B, yeah, we just have our socks on. And then after we apply A, then we put our shoes on after we put our socks on. So then after we've done both B and then A, now we have both our socks and our shoes on. Let's say we wanted to undo that and get back to barefoot us. <laughs> How would we undo the act of what we just did? Well, we, we wouldn't um, go in the same order of, of, of if we have both on. We wouldn't take our socks off and then our shoes off. We'd have to take our shoes off first and then our socks off. So the inverse of <laughs> AB needs to be first to take the shoes off. Let's see. Put socks on, put shoes on. Right. There's so, okay, yeah. Uh, let's, let's write this a little bit lower, just so I have room. The first thing that we would need to do is to take our shoes off, and then we would need to take our socks off. So now let's, let's do this. Let's say that this is us, and now we have, we got shoes. We got big shoes. <laughs> so if we need to first take our shoes off, that's the inverse of A. So then we're left with just socks. Then to, to take our socks off, then we perform B inverse. So A, B inverse of this guy gives us us without shoes. And A, B gives us us with shoes. All right. I don't know if it is admittedly like a bit hand wavy, I guess, but, but hopefully the analogy makes sense and why you would switch the operation, the, the, the product, uh, when you're performing the inverse. At least that's the way that I memorize it in my head. I'm going to call it for this video though. I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm already getting off the rails uh, a little bit, but, uh, yeah, thanks so much for watching and, uh, not quite sure what's going to be the next video yet. I have to check notes and everything, but uh, yeah, thanks for watching. I'll, I'll see you in the next one.